Welcome, dear listeners. You are listening to the Digi Competence podcast with Philip Ramin and Anne Cork. And today we're going to speak to Jason Pfeiffer, as Jason posted on LinkedIn that he's found some very strange things about himself on Google. <laughs> we'll um, give you the blurb, the official blurb on uh, Jason. Jason's the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, a non-stop optimism machine, and a widely recognized authority on business and how people navigate change. He's the author of the best-selling book, Build for Tomorrow, a startup advisor and hosts of podcasts, help wanted and problem solvers. LinkedIn named him as top voice in entrepreneurship. And he's widely known as a speaker on change, innovation, entrepreneurship, and how PR really works. Jason has also had a decades long career in national media, which included working as an editor at Men's Health, Fast Company, Maxim, and Boston Magazine, and writing about business and technology for the Washington Post, Slate, New York Magazine, and others. With his work, Jason gets behind what makes entrepreneurship fascinating and behind new technologies and social media. A secret fact about Jason, though, is that he has no sense of smell or taste. Welcome, Jason, to our podcast today. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for that generous introduction. All true. <laughs> <laughs> great. I'm great that your fact checking has worked out very well. well if you don't <laughs> if you don't have a, a sense of smell or taste, Jason, how do mm -hmm. you know if you like food? And do you still dare to try new things? Well, if I like food is is almost not a relevant question to me because I generally don't have an opinion about the food. Uh, textures can be gross. Slimy things I don't like. I don't know how many people do. But more often than not, I just don't know if something is good or not. Uh, the, the latest example, for example, <laughs> is that uh, my wife bought some feta cheese and thinks it's awful. And uh, I know I had had some before she told me it was awful and it was totally fine to me. So um, I am now, my job is now to eat the feta cheese and I will do that. That's fine. I had some last night. Finally, a person that the that an English cook can make happy. <laughs> this <laughs> is going to get a great podcast for me, Jason. <laughs> so, I, I, do you find any parallels um, in trying things without knowing what they are um, to entrepreneurship and digital transformation? Oh, that's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about the parallels. I I've heard from many many entrepreneurs who tell me that if they knew how hard the journey was going to be at the beginning, they would not have done it. Mm -hmm. And so they were grateful for a degree of ignorance about the challenge that they had just taken on. And I have thought quite a lot about that as a, just as a, as an interesting fact, it's something that people often repeat. And I think that there is something really valuable to be said about the balance between knowing what you're getting into and not knowing what you're getting into. You need to understand that the thing you're taking on is challenging and you need to know that your original ideas are not going to quite work out. There's going to have to be a lot of evolution. But I think that if you understood the full journey at the very beginning, it would be so overwhelming mm. that many people wouldn't try. And so in that way, I think not knowing something can be really useful. And I guess the same is true for me in that I generally don't know what I'm getting into with food. I mean, the thing is, unfortunately with me, is that there's also really very little that I get from it. So it doesn't really matter. However, food is still a very big part of my life. And the reason for that is because... I associate food with gathering. I mean, I'm not the only person who does this, but you know, with gathering and getting together with people. And my wife is really into food. So she she cooks a lot and we go out a lot and we often see friends over dinner. And so I find a lot of value in the things around the food, even if I don't really care about the food. And I think that's probably also true for entrepreneurship in which there's so much value around the journey, even if the individual steps of the journey are very, very difficult. Yeah, I can imagine that that's the case for very, very many entrepreneurs. You've um, you've met a lot of them in your in your work, and you've mm -hmm. you're a very renowned journalist. What would you say is your most surprising interview up until now? Oh, well, 
So there are two ways that I think when you ask me that question. Number one is the degree to which I am absolutely fascinated by the journeys of very small business owners, the journeys of someone who owns a wig shop, for example, is just so telling. And I've often found that even though I have access to the Richard Branson's of the world, that sometimes talking to the Lena who runs Lena's Wigs in Baltimore, I mean, a real example of a story, which I, I, I could tell you after this, is sometimes more helpful because the thing about Lena is that she has to figure things out. She has almost no resources beyond her own in which to figure it out. Whereas talking to Richard Branson, he's a leader, but he's got he's got a million people around him. He's got infinite resources. And the business that Lena operates, or the business that small business owners operate, is, is, is so clear and simple and straightforward that it's almost easier to draw useful, scalable lessons out of them in a way that talking about how Richard Branson navigated something, you know, he's navigating something with so many different factors and complexities that sometimes it's hard to scale that insight. And that's what I'm really interested in is scalable insight. How can I learn what somebody did and then apply it to how it can be used in many other ways? A, a filter for me is, can I stand on stage in front of a thousand entrepreneurs all doing different things and tell them a story? And every one of them says, oh, that's really useful. That's really insightful. It's hard to do with everybody. Not to say I didn't like talking to Richard Branson. I did. But that's been really surprising. And then the other thing I would say that's really surprising is, uh, you know, because I do get to talk to very, very notable, famous people, is the degree to which they are so thoughtful. I think that people often, it, it, it often looks like somebody is in a place of prominence because they just happen to be lucky or talented or a good promoter or whatever. But I mean, I've talked to Ryan Reynolds. I, you know, I've, I've met with The Rock. It's no accident. These are very talented, very thoughtful and insightful people. And I, and I, I'm just, I'm always blown away by how, how much you can unpack with somebody like that that you don't get to see when you just see them in public. Mm -hmm. How much talent is actually needed for entrepreneurship? Well, I think that it, it it's a weird way to ask that question because I think a lot of the, you know, there's like, there's talent and there's skill and there's the talent and skill of developing talent and skill. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that at the very beginning, you don't need to know that many things. Mm -hmm. What you really need to know, though, is what you don't know. And you need to be able to learn and you need to have a willingness to constantly change and adapt. And, and I've, I've talked to so many people who got into business not knowing anything about business, but having some clear-eyed understanding of something. They had a clear-eyed understanding of how to serve an audience, how to identify a need, of how to bring people together. I mean, I remember I was just talking to, again, to the small business stuff, I was just talking to a owner of a of a barbershop uh, that's done very, very well in his, his hometown of New Haven, Connecticut. And the guy started, he had no idea how to start a business. He only had $2,000 to his name. But you know what he was really good at? He was really good at drawing people to his mission. Mm -hmm. really, really good at connecting with others, convincing them to join him, to help him, to to just chip in and, and, and help him, you know, remake this storefront to whatever it was. He had a people skill and everything else could be learned along the way. Everything, uh, the right. finance and the marketing, that's, that's mm -hmm. learnable. Mm -hmm. What you need at the beginning is a clarity of vision and purpose and a willingness to learn. Mm -hmm. Jason, the, the, the reason for my question, I find it kind of, strange or remarkable that we have done so much research over decades about entrepreneurship and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And still, it seems to be like a black box and no one really knows upfront whether things will become successful, whether an uh, entrepreneur will become successful. I'm an entrepreneur on my own and I have no clue why things worked out like they have worked out. So that's, yeah. I think, kind of, kind of strange still. Well, But you could apply that to anything. Yeah. If movie studios could figure out what makes a hit movie, right. every movie would be a hit movie. Yeah. But instead, we have a ton of flops. And we, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, I don't know if you've ever 
interacted with the publishing industry, but it is wild because they are throwing money at a million projects and they know the majority of them aren't going to work out. They know. And they're the experts. There's nobody who knows this better than like Penguin Random House, but they have no idea. And so they're just taking a lot of bets. And basically the business model is we're going to fund a ton of books and three of them are going to subsidize all of our other bets and be the profit drivers for our business. And then all and then and then become the back titles, which is where they really make their money. Right. People just don't know. And I think the reason for that is because there are simply too many factors that go into why something works. And so if you are an entrepreneur, I would caution you against being overly reliant upon the success or the failure of any one thing that you do. Uh, the, a better way of measuring somebody's success is over the long journey and seeing how they take failures, even failures of companies, multiple, and build that in to their next insight. Because that's often the true story of success. It's Stuart Butterfield starting a video game that did not take off and then folding it, returning his investor money, and then thinking about how the internal chat function of that video game was pretty useful, spinning that out as its own product, and that becomes Slack. And that story repeats itself over and over again. And what it tells you is that the true measure of success and really the true skill is the ability to treat everything around you and every experience as a data point mm. and then use that data to just triangulate what the right opportunity is. That is a very, very hard thing to do. One, because it's just hard, but also two, because it requires a lot of patience and a lot of real terrible blows to your ego and a lot of sleepless nights. And not everybody's up for that, but mm -hmm. that's what it takes. Because mm -hmm. the to to build a successful business or to create a successful movie or to write a successful book is to is to have stars aligned, more factors, ever changing factors than we could ever actually calculate. We will never build a machine. There will never be AI that can just tell you whether or not something will succeed. It is simply not possible. There are too many factors. So the best that you can do is to absorb that and carry on. Mm -hmm. what, a, what a relief to hear you say that, uh, Jason, being a person who's won two awards for failing in <laughs> Germany. I am, I'm, I'm really glad. To do, do they give out awards for failing in Germany? Yeah, they certainly do, do, do now since I, I've been here. Oh. I've won two of them. I love that. <laughs> but uh, that's another story. Um, when you when you write, you write a lot about change and people are very, very frightened of change. Um, I heard an interview with you where you, you spoke about people yelling at people driving cars, telling uh -huh. them to get horses. <laughs> Our fear of new technologies, how much does it hold us back? Our fear of change? It's a good question. I think that in the long run, societally, culturally, I'm not totally sure that it does hold us back. I'm sure there's some academics who could push back against that. But the reason I say that is because as I look back in history and for context, I, I, I've i spent years researching the history of technology. I, I had a podcast that was about it. And, and I use a lot of that insight and research in my current work. It was in my book and I, I use it when I speak, including that story about the horseless carriage. So, you know, what you were referencing there is that the horseless carriage, when it first came out, which is the early car, they called it the horseless carriage, 1800s, was a really despised object. People called it the devil wagon. They threw rocks at it. They would yell, get a horse from the sidewalk, get a horse. You can find like decades of old newspapers have the phrase, get a horse in them. It's really funny. And, and you see that, you see echoes of that today, the way that we talk culturally about AI and the way that social media has become demonized. And, you know, we're always extrapolating outward. We say, oh, because this technology has been introduced, it's going to radically change the way that we do X, Y, or Z thing, which is the same as when telephones were introduced, that we weren't going to see people in person, because why would we need to do that anymore? When recorded music, when the phonograph, uh, you know, kind of early record player was introduced, 
a lot of predictions about the decline of the music industry, because why would anyone, for example, learn to play an instrument when now a machine can just play music for you? Uh, of course, the, the opposite was true. Uh, uh, when the phonograph became popularized, uh, sales of musical instruments actually shot up because it, it inspired people to want to play. So what I see is a lot of cultural fear of change and a lot of debate. And some of that debate is very reasonable because that debate can be around safety, which is which is an important thing to discuss, but also progress, forward progress. I mean, if we were really stuck on the question of whether or not radio was addictive, which was a real debate in the 1920s, I guess, uh, uh, you know, we'd still be debating that now. Uh, we wouldn't have the kinds of technology, the communications technology that we have. We'd still be on radio. So I think we do move forward. I think the challenges on an individual basis and on a cultural basis is that we might be less willing to move towards opportunities. And you see that now very, very clearly. The perhaps the, you know the number of people who put a lot of their energy and time into trying to stop things, absolutely needlessly so, is I think disappointing. Mm -hmm. And there are probably many people who have incredible skill and insight who could create amazing things with AI or with whatever the next technology is going to be, who aren't doing it because they're afraid of it, they're concerned of it, whatever it is, I, I think is a, is, a, is a loss for us all. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that they are single-handedly stopping it. We also have amazing technologists and creators who are stepping into that space. So I would put it on an individual level and, and really ask yourself, when you see technology changing the way that you operate, instead of being worried about what loss that could create, you should, you should, you should ask yourself, is the thing that this threatens to replace perfect? Is it, is it perfect? Is the thing that you're doing right now that you're worried will change because of technology, is that perfect? Because if it's not, and I would guess that it's not, then pushing against change is protecting an imperfect system at the expense of creating something better. And that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. I would rather ask the question, what new value can I unlock? And if you have concerns about safety or culture or whatever the case is, well, then that's great. Build those concerns into the thing that you are creating. Mm -hmm. Popularize it. Introduce the value of it. But don't try to stop it. What about learning, Jason? Um, what kind of a role does learning play in innovation? As uh, From an individual basis? Yeah. Well, the phrase that's kicked around in entrepreneurship a lot is lifelong learner, uh, which I like a lot. I think that entrepreneurs have to be lifelong learners. You will, you will, you will, uh, okay, there's a, there's a exercise that I do sometimes when I'm speaking either to, I, I get hired to speak at a lot of companies, uh, executive retreats, uh, uh, but also colleges. And those are two different audiences, uh, seasoned executives, seasoned professionals and, and college students, just, just, just glimpsing their future. And I do this exercise. I've done it with both, which it's, it's a kind of longer thing. You can read the whole thing in my, in my book. I, I won't spend the next 20 minutes telling it to you, but it's, um, the idea is to, and I got this from a guy named Warren Hatch, who's the CEO of a forecasting company called Good Judgment. And he was he was giving me an example of an assessment that he runs on whether or not people are overconfident. And the question, the, the question that he gave me was, what year was Gandhi born? And, uh, you know, and I was like, I, when he asked it to me, I said, I don't know what year Gandhi was born. And he says, it's fine. It's not a trivia question. Just tell me the earliest and the latest years that you think Gandhi was born the earliest and the latest. And so this is what I've repeated to uh, people on stage. I ask them to think about the earliest and latest, and then if they're comfortable, which they often are not, but they're comfortable to kind of shout out the answers. 
Now, I will tell you, my answer was awful. It's just so embarrassing. It was 1940 to 1955, which is like, it couldn't be the more wrong answer. The answer is 1869. That's But uh, but he asked me for a range. And what I did was I picked a 15-year range, 40 to 55, based on no information. I didn't know when Gandhi was born. And the point that Warren makes is that we have to be aware of the knowledge we think we have. How aware are you of the knowledge that you think you have? And what are you, what information are you willing to consider? He terms, he speaks of it in terms of bands. He says that my bands were too narrow, 40 to 55, because I could have had wider bands. He asked me the earliest and the latest year, I think Gandhi was born. If I don't know anything about Gandhi, then the answer should have been 1600 to 1980. You know, I don't know, just mm -hmm. consider everything. That would have actually been the right answer. And so, uh, and, and he says, look, when we enter into circumstances and we don't know the information, but we're not willing to engage with that fact that we don't know the information, then what we do is we narrow our bands and we only consider a narrow band of information. And then we set ourselves up for statistical failure because we're going to make a decision based on limited information. And then we're going to make another decision on top of that decision. And then we're going to make another decision on top of that decision. And in doing so, we put ourselves really far out on a statistical limb, needlessly so. That was his language. And anyway, the reason I tell you that is, and the whole thing about doing this exercise in front of people is that I, when I do this exercise in front of seasoned professionals, they often make the same mistake that I did. It's often not the as bad. Like I, I usually have the worst guess in the room, 1940 to 950. But people will often be, you know, 1900 to 1910 or 1890 to 1915 or something like that. It's all pretty narrow. It's all 10, 15, 20 year ranges. And uh, and then at the, at the end, I always ask people to raise their hands if they made the same like band with mistake as me uh, and chose a range of 15, 20 years. And like almost every hand in the room goes up, hundreds of hands. College students, I don't do that. Totally, totally different experience. College students, as soon as I ask them to just to guess, they all just start shouting out and they're all broad ranges. 1800 to 1900, uh, as they'll say, you know, like 1850 to, to 1950. Like they, they just, and, and I was thinking, what is it? Like what, what's going on? And I realized that what's going on is that seasoned professionals, the older and more accomplished you get, the more you move through the world with the expectation that you must know things. And therefore, it's very uncomfortable to engage with the idea that you don't know things. Mm -hmm. And so when you are presented with a challenge, if you don't know the answer, you will conjure up some answer and then you'll bet on it, which is the wrong way to be. The best way to be is the way that the college students operate. They move through the world with zero expectation that they know things. They have no expectation of that. Instead, they move through the world with the expectation that they can learn things. And that's more valuable. And so to, you know, to your question, the, uh, the reason why learning is important is because it's really not about like learning. Obviously learning is important. Like, it's never going to be a shock for somebody to say learning is important, but what's really important is to be willing to admit that you don't know things and to build that into the way that you make decisions because we should all and can all be like the college students mm -hmm. who just enter circumstances saying, I do not know, and it's totally fine that I don't. Maybe maybe my next question fits to, to your answer, actually. Um, how much unlearning do we need for such a process? I mean, at the end, we, we do have a certain capacity, but maybe we also need to unlearn some stuff from the past in order to become open for the future, what are your thoughts about that? Maybe I, I think it's it's hard to unlearn things. It's better to surround yourself with people who provide better, more uh, unique ideas. Just as an example, from an evolution yeah. perspective, um, who of us can still do some, you know, some fire outside in the woods and stuff like oh, that? Oh yeah, but see, but that that's an interesting thing that 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 what you just say there. So um, there's an interesting study about bonobos and chimpanzees. And every time that I say this, I like forget which which was which, which was the bonobo and the chimpanzee in this circumstance. So I'll just I'll just plant a flag here, but I, I could have it backwards. So I think it was that the chimpanzees in the wild used tools to get food. 
So for example, they'll use a stick to get ants out of a hole or something, right? They're, they're, they're utilizing natural tools and, and creating tools for the purposes of getting food. Bonobos don't do that. They don't use tools to get food. And these two, these two animal species are very genetically similar. So there shouldn't really be a cognitive explanation for why one is using tools and the other one isn't. So what's the explanation? Well, to start, uh, scientists um, wanted to see if they could teach the bonobos to use tools to get food. And the answer was yes, very easily. Like it's, there's no problem doing that. Um, if you if you introduce the idea of the tools and also you provide uh, food that requires tools, the bonobos, bonobos pick it right up, no problem. So why are they not doing it? Well, the answer it seems to be the environment that the, the bonobos developed in an area where there was plenty of food available that didn't require tools. So there was just no need to develop that skill. Whereas the chimpanzees were in different environments that required the tools. And so they did develop the skill. And the point of this is that just because we haven't developed a skill or because we've let a skill atrophy doesn't mean that we can't get it again if we need it. Uh, you know, people often uh, when they bemoan technology, uh, ch you know, changing the way that we behave, they'll say things like, "We used to know so many phone numbers, and now I don't know any phone numbers." You know, like, it's all just on my phone. I don't remember. Yeah, but right. like the thing is, it doesn't matter. That is a that is a that is a it's a it's a kind of boring observation that is also telling of nothing. Because if we lived in a world where we had to remember the phone numbers, we would, but we don't. And the thing is that our brains are primarily a deletion device. But our brains are primarily deleting things because there's, you know, if you think of it like a hard drive or something, there's limited capacity. We have limited brain capacity. We can't remember everything. We can't know everything. What we have to do is make hard decisions about mm -hmm. where we shift our cognitive load. And so we're going to shift it towards the tools and the skills that are most relevant to our success in our environment now. And that's not to say that we couldn't shift if needed, right? I mean, if I if if I um, move to a different environment and I need different skills to survive, I will adapt. But right now, I live in Brooklyn, New York. I don't need to know how to make a fire. I just don't. And so I'm not I'm not going to learn it. And if, even if I learned it, I wouldn't do it often enough to remember how to do it. And that's fine. I don't really think of that necessarily as unlearning things. Mm -hmm. I, I really think of that as just adapting to to new environments. Mm -hmm. If if you want to evolve in a changing world, then the best thing that you can do is put yourself in evolving situations to be in be in in organizations that are tackling new challenges and to be surrounded by people who are thinking in new ways. You will adapt. You will change to meet that circumstance. And so, you know, I, I think it's 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 hard for someone to kind of like catalog what they know and what they don't know and say, well, I, this I should delete the way that I can delete a file from the computer. We, we, we can't do that. But we certainly can just stop engaging with things and start engaging with other things. Uh, you know, I mean, if I... Uh, if I taught myself how to play the guitar and then I decided that that wasn't that useful and I stopped playing the guitar for the next 20 years, I would learn something else and the ability to play the guitar would be diminished. And that would be fine because I don't need to play the guitar because I'm not a rock star. But if I want to go and pick the guitar up again later, that's fine. I can do that too. It, it happens through circumstance. It doesn't just happen through decision. Mm -hmm. Jason, you, that really um, resounds with something that the World Economic Forum brought out this week about um, immersing children in different social groups to actually make sure that they're exposed to different environments to learn. Mm. But just as a, um, a side remark, I bet your neighbors will be very glad that you've forgotten how to make open fires. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> because yeah, that's right. of the danger of it. Yeah, we're going to skip all fires out here. <laughs> How how much do people need to be able to put them, themselves in the shoes of other people to be able to innovate and also to be able to communicate with the press? Oh, well, look, all, all success, I think, in, in every medium is reliant upon understanding the needs of whoever it is that you're connecting with and serving, right? It's sort of as simple as that. Like, I think that the most, the thing that everybody wants in the world is to be heard, 
just I think like the number one after food is just be heard. And so you are more successful when you show people that you hear them. And that's true when you're building a business and trying to connect with customers. And it's true if you're trying to get press in that you need to understand the person who you're trying to reach out to. If, if you don't know how a journalist thinks about their work, you're not going to be able to communicate with them in a way that's going to seem meaningful to them. And, and I don't mean meaningful in some, like, you know, you're not looking, look, you're not like trying to be best friends, but you have to understand what it is that professionally they are seeking, which is usually they're seeking to serve their audience. So you better understand how they serve their audience in the same way that if you, I always like to make the analogy to um, going out to investors because you don't just go to an investor if you, if you don't understand their job and what they're looking for and who they invest in and why. And if you did, if you didn't do that, you, you wouldn't even get in the room. And the same is true for media and the same is true for everybody. The more in which you lead with what you want, uh, the less you actually get of what you want. Mm -hmm. And so it's, 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 it's absolutely critical uh, that, uh, you know, this, I mean, the, the starting point has to be listening skills and understanding um, people's incentives and their desires and then speaking that right back to them in a way in which you speak their language, you build what I like to call a bridge of familiarity, which is to say you never start with you. Mm -hmm. You never, ever build a bridge from you to them. You always build a bridge from them to you. And that, 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 that's their language, and that's their goals, and that's their needs. And the more that you reflect that back to them, the more you get everything. That's the key to marketing. That's the key to communications. That's the key to customer acquisition. That's everything. Jason, N and me, we are located here in Germany. What are your thoughts and reflections about innovation and entrepreneurship in Germany? Do you have some thoughts about that? We would be very curious about that. Oh, I wish I knew the German market well enough to have a really good answer for you. I can tell you, this is, I can tell you, this is like not useless, not useful information in any way, but when my wife and I play the game, as I'm sure everyone does, of where would where would you live if it wasn't here? You know, like if 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 in a different life, where would you live? Honestly, my answer is Berlin. Uh, it's like, oh, it's been my answer for a very long time because just because I've been to Berlin three times, I just really like it. Uh, it just seems like a fun, energetic city, a lot of creativity. People seem to be trying all sorts of new things. Um, I remember the first time I went and when I was in my 20s, and I took like one of those biking tours. And uh, and one of the one of the the, the tour guides said, um, um, Berlin is always becoming, it never is. And uh <laughs> Yeah, and I really like that. It's just a great line, um, and I and I like I like that. It's, I feel like that's what people should be too. Right? You know, you should always be coming, but you know, you never are. Mm -hmm. um, and but but I don't know. I mean, you know, I've met I've met plenty of German entrepreneurs. I, I actually very interestingly, the, the data for a lot of for for a bunch of my projects has always shown um, like a very high uh, audience rate in Germany. Like when I did that 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 when I did that that history podcast a while ago, for example. Um, Germany actually was the the leading audience outside of um, outside of uh, the kind of English speaking you know, America, England, Canada. Uh, so that's been really interesting, and I, I've I've always been curious about what it is about what's going on in Germany that that connects with my work. Um, but I don't know. You tell me. I, I I wish I had a better answer. Well, we struggle a bit at the moment, but I think this is an episode on its own. But in any case, you will have more listeners and fans after this episode because <laughs> more Germans will get to know you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> and I, I suppose it sadly means that your book, Build for Tomorrow, has not come out in German yet. Uh, Jason, is that it right? It has not. <laughs> no. I mean, I had a I had a UK publisher. Uh, so it came out. It came out. I had a there was a, you know, it was published in America and then and then it was published um Uh, in the UK and the UK deal covered a lot of territory, like a lot of territory. So it's possible that there's a kind of local publishing for Build for Tomorrow, but it's not in a German edition. So uh, unfortunately, I'm stuck with whoever um, just knows English, which seems to be a lot of people in Germany. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> An awful lot of people. And a lot of people <laughs> read the New York Times and the Washington Post, yeah. mm -hmm. where your mm -hmm. book was actually reviewed. Talking about that, the book uh, deals with a lot of um, issues on change. What makes people resilient to change? Well, 
I think the number one thing that makes people resilient to change is a clarity of what does not change. I think the scariest part about change is that it feels like loss to people. Change, we, I, you know, we, we, decades of psychological research have confirmed what's called loss aversion theory, which is to say that we are naturally programmed to avoid loss, to protect against loss more than we are to seek gain. And so when something changes, we immediately equate it to loss. We identify what we lose. We start to extrapolate it. We say, because I lost this, I'm going to lose that. Because I lost that, I'm going to lose that other thing. And then we start to panic. And what's really valuable is to identify the things about you that do not change in times of change. That's the thing that seems to really carry through for incredibly adaptable people. They have a sense, they have an understanding of what they do incredibly well and what their mission is, such that every new thing becomes a new way to do the thing that they already do. I like to ask people to come up with a mission statement for themselves. It should be short, simple sentence. First word is I, and then every word carefully selected because it is not anchored to something that's easily changeable. So mm. for example, for me, I could say I am a magazine editor, but that's so easily changeable, so easily changeable. All, all it takes is I mean, I don't, I, you know, I'm the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, but I don't own Entrepreneur Magazine. Get fired at any time. I get fired right now. And so that would be the end of that. That would be the end of that mission statement for myself. I don't like that. That's too disruptive. Mm -hmm. So instead, I came up with this I tell stories in my own voice. That's seven words. I tell stories in my own voice. That you can't take away from me. Stories is everything. Stories is. I mean, you know, we've been talking for about 40 something minutes. I've told you a whole lot of stories. This is how I speak. Stories is how I write. Stories is how I consult. Stories is everything. And in my own voice is me setting the terms for how I want to operate. It doesn't, at this stage of my career, it doesn't matter what comes next. I mean, I've talked, I, I, I talk about a lot of different interesting business opportunities um, with potential collaborators. And, and the thing that I can always bring in value is stories. Uh, because I can communicate and I can understand that the story that this organization would tell to others and tell to itself and uh, bring other people in because I can tell the right story to them. Once I understand that and understand how that scales, it makes change a lot less scary because mm -hmm. I recognize that no matter what happens, I'm not losing the core thing that I have. And once we feel that stability, everything else can swirl. We are running out of time a bit, so let's let's rush directly to our last famous questions we are asking to all of our guests. All right, famous questions. <laughs> yeah, very famous questions. And I want to start with the first one, and um, maybe you can answer it quite you know, on point. Um, what are the three points or the three topics which have their highest priority for you in the next months? And you can, you know, you can choose on which level you answer the question on a professional level or economic, political, whatsoever. Oh, uh, I'll answer personal. I'll leave economic and big things to somebody else. Um, personally, I am, I, this was the year of many things for me, but one of them was the year of the newsletter. Uh, mm -hmm. I really wanted to understand newsletters. I really wanted to take mine seriously, grow it into a real product. And so that was a big focus of mine. And I, and I, 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 I feel proud of what I did. Um, I have a newsletter. It's called One Thing Better. Uh, one way each week to feel more successful and satisfied and build a career or company you love. You can find it at onethingbetter.email. That's a web address. Just mm -hmm. plug it into a browser, onethingbetter.email. Anyway, uh, as we talk here in December of 2023, I've built it out to 45,000 subscribers and I turned on the monetization. Right. And, uh, um, and actually, you know, we're, so we're talking, I mean, we're very literally talking, I don't know when you're going to put this out, but we're talking on, on uh, Wednesday, December 13th, and it's 11.45 a.m. my time. And at three or four, I think four, at 4 p.m., so in just a couple hours, I'm going to do my first office hours uh, with with that premium group. That was a, an offering that I made, um, was to do a monthly office hours with anybody who had upgraded to my premium. And I have, honestly, I mean, I'm four hours away. I do not know how that's going to go. I don't exactly know how I'm going to run that. It's going to be such a learning experience for me, but, but that's the thing that I've found so incredibly valuable about this. You just can't know how to do these things until you do them. 
So, um, so do, you know, to build a newsletter is to literally do it, to build a newsletter, just get in there, understand what's wrong, um, and, and to fix it, uh, and then create, and then find the next new set of problems and then try to fix that and just keep doing that. So, um, anyway, next year will be about, about progressing there. That'll be really exciting. Um, I, um, uh, I, I learned a hell of a lot about, uh, the speaking business, the business this year, I kind of doubled my speaking business, but I feel like there's a lot more to learn. Um, I want to figure out how to double, start doubling things. I want to start doubling my fees, start doubling everything. So, um, I'm going to be really excited to, to dive into that more. Um, and then, uh, at entrepreneur magazine, entrepreneur media is the name of the parent company. There's, you know, there's a lot happening and, um, and we're starting to think really big and bold about how to, um, meet the ever-changing needs of entrepreneurs. And I have to keep it vague there so far, but that's going to be a big focus of mine is um, is is how to identify and really seize uh, some new opportunities in that space. And so um, there'll be a lot of learning that'll go on there too. Mm -hmm. Great, Jason. I have the honor of asking the last question. All right. Um, if we were to, to um, ask you to give advice to people, three skills that they should be learning for the future, what would be your recommendation? Oh, well, I think that in a way we've kind of already covered it. Uh, I think, you know, the skill of the skill of adaptability is is just mm -hmm. so incredibly important. Um, I think the skill of constant learning um, is is really important. And then the skill of audience understanding is really important. Um, and, and I think that if, you know, if you if you can if you can find if you can become more comfortable with change and if you can um uh, understand the people that you serve and you can be putting yourself in positions to be always absorbing new information. Uh, I, I just don't think that you could set yourself up any better. Fantastic, Chetan. Yeah, so that's it. Um, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for the inspiration. It was fantastic talking to you. Well, thanks for having me, guys. And, you know, for anybody who wants to get in touch, uh, that newsletter that I said, one thing better, one thing better dot email is the web address. Uh, if you subscribe, uh, you'll get a welcome email. And if you respond to that, uh, it goes directly in my inbox and I, I'll, I'll get back to you. Jason, I'll say thank you too. That was our conversation today with the man that um, is doubling everything, who's <laughs> <laughs> delving into newsletters, who without a sense of smell can smell an innovation from a mile off and who says, if you want to deal with change, find the things that don't change. That was our conversation today with Jason Pfeiffer, editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine and author of the book, Building Tomorrow, which build, is uh, not- build, <laughs> Sorry, I'll just, I'll just cry. Uh, build, 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 for build for tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes, build, build for, for tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> sorry, build for tomorrow, which is not out in German yet. Any publishers listening, <laughs> well, not out in German, but probably <laughs> available in Germany. Uh, and I bet if you go to Amazon or or whatever, uh, you could easily find it. <laughs> and um, we'd like to say thank you to all our listeners today. And if any of you have a suggestion for someone just as interesting as Jason's been today, <clears throat> then please send us an email at podcast at i40.de. And with our hashtag, hashtag DiggyCompetence podcast, you can follow what happens in our podcast. And the people that are with us often will know, Philip and I, we're going to do <laughs> somersaults again when you're with us the next time when we say stay digitally competent with Philip Ramin and Anne Kowak. Mm -hmm.